Hi, um, today I want to talk about soldering irons for use away from the bench. Um, this could be if you're working on site or you're working on a car or something, so you don't have the luxury of your nice sort of big sort of um, home soldering iron setup. So um, there's a variety of options. We've got battery, gas, and also um, some low voltage. DC iron, also a self-contained um, standalone mains operated iron. Now each of these has its plus, plus and minus points, I'm just going to sort of go through the one at a time and sort of say what I think is good and bad about each type, but also what I think would be the ideal product that no one sort of really makes yet, but I think they're, they're getting quite close. Right, first of all, I shall quickly uh, mention this one. This is un this is uh, basically a mains iron, so this is for your situations, for example, like you know the hotel room repair session, or where you're working at um, maybe like a customer's office where you don't you know you don't want to cut the the big soldering iron station, but you do have access to mains power. I believe the tips are compatible with Hacko, which is good. Um, so it's self-contained, so it uses a mains element, and it's got a little LCD showing the temperature display. You can set the temperature up with these buttons, so there's a the little dot on the bottom of the display it actually gives you the element on off state, so once it's warmed up you'll see the temperature stabilise. Quite nice, it feels reasonably well made, it's got a nice rubbery grip here, it feels quite solid and it's probably not, not ideal for like super super fine work, but for general purpose holding and say the fact that you've got the, 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 the fairly wide range of HACO tips is, yeah, it's pretty good. So it's, so it's just about the temperature there. I think I'll set it about to 280 so you can just use these buttons to set the temperature up and down. Um, one thing I don't like about it, this isn't the original mains lead, this is a three core lead that I put on it. What it actually comes with is this two core lead with a separate ground wire. It's got a switch, so the switch is really nice, I like that. So you can yeah, switch it on and off easily. It would be nice to have had a neon or something, a nice sort of clear indicator that it's switched on. And it comes with this stupid plug for some third world country. Especially as this one, this is a 110 type plug, but this is a 220 volt iron. It will just about work on two on 110, but it's really, really sort of underpowered. But at uh, 240, it's yeah, it's quite good so far. And the rating of this is uh, 60 watts at 220 volts. Yeah, a situation where you don't want to take a full full soldering station, but you do have power. I actually quite like this. This is quite a nice, um, quite a nice solution. They're not particularly expensive, so it's quite yeah, quite a handy thing to have in your toolkit. It's certainly better than all the non-temperature controlled um, mains voltage irons that are out there. Let me just take a quick look inside this. We've got the um, ceramic heater. And all the plastic parts feel that yeah, it feels like a good quality sort of glass filled plastic. It, yeah, it does actually have quite a good good feel to it. It's not like soup doesn't feel super cheap. And we've got the PCB inside, pretty much what you'd expect. There's a triac temperature control. For some reason, they thought it made sense to scrub the numbers off the triac, which is a bit bit childish. Um, you've got a dropper cap to provide the low voltage supply for the. Um, low voltage thing, there's some obscure microcontroller on there driving an LCD. So yeah, reasonably well made. The thing I don't like about it, the earth connection just goes runs through this sort of PCB track onto this spring clip. So if you were to touch this onto something, say a DC source that was grounded, and it wouldn't take much to blow that track out, so you could end up with a situation where you had a non-earthed um, tip which is not ideal but apart from that it's sort of yeah fairly reasonable it's fairly cheap the cable grip is sort of reasonably okay if so i've replaced it around you might struggle to get a thicker mains cable this is actually some quite i don't think they actually make mains cable this thin anymore so the standard three amp cable might be a bit of a struggle to get into this grip but uh, i think you might just about do it but um for a sort of a reasonable iron you know just to take with you on a job i, I think it's actually not too bad Okay, now moving on to the self-powered irons. Now, probably the most common and popular type over the last few decades has been the gas iron. Um, there's quite a few of these on the market. Now, in the past, I've had a um, couple of these Weller Pyro pens. There's the Pyro Pen Junior and the self-igniting one. Now, the build quality of the yeah, these are quite expensive. The build quality seems really good, but every time I've wanted to use one of these in the field, they've let me down for various reasons. Now, I don't know if I've just been unlucky or there's some sort of systematic problem, but I've had things like there's a tiny little aperture in there that regulates the gas flow. I've had those get blocked, so the thing basically becomes unusable. The piezo, I've had that, you know, that's, I had one, I had another one of these where the piezo was just almost impossible to use, so you ended up having to light the thing with a lighter. Uh, they seem to be really bad at lighting if there's any wind at all. And I've had things like the um, the sort of catalysts disintegrate, the sort of bottom part of the tips fall out and the catalyst disintegrate. So, yeah, it could just be that I've been unlucky, but I'm, you know, 
although they do appear to be quite nice you've got this nice sort of transparent clear thing to see how much gas it gas is in there and you've got this sort of cover that slips over and i think it's supposed to actually turn the gas off but uh, this might not be the right cover for this iron because it doesn't seem to actually um do that properly so you know in principle this ought to be a quite a nice iron this has actually got a hot air tip on it rather than a, the um the soldering one but say so I've, I've always found these things to be disappointing but I mean, this is probably 10 years old so maybe they've improved maybe i've been unlucky uh, the junior one um i don't like this particularly although it's quite a nice small form factor and you've actually got a metal cover on it which is quite nice because it's not self-igniting you've got to dick around taking a bloody lighter with you it's just you know why couldn't they have just built a little flick you know front lighter or something into the lid on there it'd have been far more far more useful so um well, again it looks yeah it looks and feels quite nice but in practice i don't particularly like that and there's no real need for it to be that small particularly one disadvantage of all gas irons basically the way they work is in the top of here there's a catalyst so that when you light them the flame heats the catalyst up and then the catalyst takes over so you don't get a flame while it's running but what you do get is a blast of very hot air coming out the side of here which obviously if you're doing soldering you've got to be very careful that you're not melting any metal also, you know it can be useful if you're doing heat shrink and um, yeah they mostly come with um heat shrink nozzles as well as the um the standard soldering nozzle but you don't yeah you know, unless you're doing a lot of heat shrinking you generally don't need these you just use you know you just use the soldering nozzle and use the side sideways thing but um the problem with all gas irons is they generally run too hot you tend to have to turn the gas quite high to light them and obviously you, you then really want to turn them right you know, down quite low but even at low setting they do tend to overheat which may tends to oxidize the solder if you're trying to get a nice clean solder joint they you know, it, if you're overheating it really it get, tends to get really oxidized if you turn this down so it doesn't overheat then your power is really limited so that you, know, you, you stick it on a joint and the temperature disappears i'm sure it would be feasible to make one of these that has some measure of temperature control by maybe some sort of clever thermostatic detail that perhaps draws in some cold air oh, oh yeah the catalyst needs a certain minimum temperature to work so you can't you know, turn that turn the temperature of everything down but there must be some way of thermostatically regulating the amount of cold air that comes in to actually get at least some regulation of the tip temperature but i've, I've yet to see one that you know, gas irons haven't really changed much in many many years um as far as gas irons go um this one i got a while ago this is the uh, portasol super pro and this is certainly the best gas iron i've used it feels yeah it feels a little bit more plasticky than the weller but in terms of functionality you know it, it, it lights reliably it seems to work quite nicely you've you you know, you've got some gas indication through this translucent thing here the piezo lighter works works quite well so you tend to have to turn, turn it up um, one thing I do like on this is you've got this little hole in the side that shows you when it's lit because one problem is particularly if you've got a lot of ambient noise it can be difficult to know if the thing's lit you know you turn it on you hear the hiss of the gas and then you know you're flicking the igniter and you don't actually know if the catalyst lit or not so the nice thing about this is you do actually get this nice orangey glow um, so you can turn it down one thing I really like about this is it's got this nice little stand so you can just sit it on somewhere still running with minimal risk of setting fire to stuff yeah, as gas irons go, yeah, this one's worked reliably. It seems to not not particularly mind wind and so on. Cover works quite well, and that when you put the cover on, it forces the um, this off. So if you need to, you can just stick the cover on, sling it in your pocket. There's a little bit of air vent for it to cool down. Because obviously, with a portable iron, you know, you might be in a situation, for example, you're up a ladder or up a cherry picker or something, so you don't have anywhere to put stuff down. So you want to may want to do a solder joint and then literally put it straight back in your pocket or put it somewhere. Um, out of the way so you might not have the opportunity but so you do have this this handy little stand one other thing which is i, I find a problem with every yeah you know, i've yet to see any gas iron that addresses is something really really simple and that is obviously you know you've got a soldering iron well you need solder and none of them have a nice well-designed way of actually storing solder with the iron because obviously you know you go up yeah you know, a ladder you take your salt you, you, your, your iron then suddenly find you haven't got any solder with you which is a bit of a nightmare um, you know, all it would take would be just literally like a slot in the body so you could just wind, you know, wind a little roll of solder around it say so to some extent you know you can sort of budget and do this but it, it would be nice just to have some purpose-made way of storing solder on these things this one comes as a set there's a few other accessories there's um this hot no, i think this is the idea behind this is for things like cutting right plastic rope and so on so you sort of cut and seal at the same time and it comes with uh, you know, the hot air nozzle um this sort of little spongy thing it also comes with this the idea behind this is for doing things like heat shrink where you um, use this in conjunction with the hot air nozzle the idea being that it deflects heat so you get heat all the way around it now i don't actually find this to be that useful the problem is that 
it's very hard to control. You've got your you know, sleeving in here, you're, you're heating all around it, but you've got no real way of con easily controlling the um, the amount of heat. Whereas if you just take your sleeving um, with this, at least you can actually control, you know, use the distance. So as soon as it starts shrinking, you can back it off, you get much more control. So um, not really a big fan of that. But um, so for gen general, yeah, medium to heavy solder soldering iron, yeah, this is probably a fairly reasonable solution. Um, the other disadvantage, of course, on all gas irons is they don't have any sort of work like, because again, you're quite from soldering in maybe difficult visibility, either in the dark or in a dark dark corner. Uh, yeah, as far as I'm aware, this is about as good as gas irons get. Say so the later wellers may be good. I, I really don't know. I just yeah, had bad experience with them, so I sort of tend to avoid them. And say so if yeah, if someone actually put some thought into doing some sort of thermostatic control, I think they could actually be overcome with it, which I think is probably one of the worst problems with them is that is the overheating issue, especially if you're trying to work on anything vaguely delicate. It's very hard to get get the right temperature, and also not uh, incinerate things with the hot air get head hot air blast coming up here. Right over to portable electric irons. Now the, the various there's been various battery operated irons around for like decades, and they've mostly been sort of pretty rubbish. Um, this is one that I bought fairly recently for a very specific purpose. Um, this runs on four double A's. The rating is six and eight eight watts. Basically, you've got a, a switch that's got high, low and high positions. What happens is on the low position, it just connects a diode to the one in four, 5401 diode in series with the element. So I bought this for, for a very specific purpose where I knew I wasn't going to need a huge amount of power because it's, you know, eight watts is just hopelessly underpowered for all but really fine work. And the reason I got this was that I knew I was going to have to do some uh, patch repairs on some uh, lead tape up a cherry picker, so it was a fairly hostile environment, and the overheating issue with gas irons was a, a bit of a pain. So for this particular job, this is just about okay. Uh, one nice thing, you've got this nice work light so you can see what you're doing. It does come with a two, two tip sizes, a sort of small pointy one that's not really tapered enough but so if, I, yeah, if, if you know for certain that all you're going to be doing is very fine work this might be okay um, you do get the equivalent of sort of car range anxiety and I, yeah, I doubt the batteries last very long so you'd probably want to take quite a few spare batteries with you again there's no temperature control uh, you know basically you sort of turn it on it takes about 30 seconds or so to heat up and then you can take it, stick it down to low to give it a, a more of an idle thing so it's it's not great, you know, if you know you're doing lightweight work, maybe. Um, but what would be interesting is something like this with maybe a couple of lipos in it um, and maybe some temperature control. I think I was, before I sort of started looking more recently about irons, I'd done a bit of thinking about, well, you know, what would be the ideal portable iron? And I was thinking something of, you know, like, say, a couple of tool grade lipos with a low voltage element and temperature control so it could actually heat up really quickly get the job done and then turn off again and sort of a couple of these lipos will give you a quite a reasonable sort of form factor um i haven't actually bought a well, i was sort of looking at yeah in terms of decent soldering irons you know for like really high power you're looking at really either metcal or jbc the problem with metcal is because it's rf the power supply is quite inefficient so i actually bought a jbc tip to start experimenting with but these run on like normally about 24 volts so boosting lipos up to 24 volts so around 50 to 60 watts is going to be somewhat non-trivial so I, I, i've yet to really investigate that but in terms of like a completely self-contained iron something like yeah that's going to be too long in that sort of form factor but something like this yeah almost imagine that but with the you know the body reshaped just a couple, a couple of lipos and a bit more power I think that could actually be getting towards quite a nice self-contained solution. You could have like a, a USB charge or a high current charge, so you could you know charge from whatever's convenient. Obviously, you could have the, the work light as well. You could have sort of reasonable power control, temperature setability, and so on. So I think that that will probably be about the ultimate portable iron, which nobody makes yet. Right. So this brings on. Uh, Brings us on to this. Now, this is a fairly recent um, product known as the TS100. It's available from a variety of sort of the various Chinese sources. If you just search for TS100 soldering on, you'll, you'll find it's quite a wide range of prices. I think some of them actually come as kits with a number of different tips. Um, I just got this one um, with this uh, single tip on it. Now, this is a, yeah, a fairly new approach in that basically it uh, runs off 12 to 24 volts DC. Obviously, yeah, the thinking behind that is it actually gives you quite a lot of flexibility. Basically, if you're in a situation where you're near a main supply, yeah, there's a good chance that you've already got a suitable supply. Typically, a laptop adapter. This is a 20 volt, 20 volt um, adapter, which I'll just because I use this to power all sorts of other things. I've sort of added a just a, a plug-in terminal block, so I can plug various other things into this. So for main, yeah, for mains operation, you're covered with this. So you know you've got you're not taking a huge amount of additional weight, particularly if you're travelling. 
um, you basically just got this and the power supply you're already taking. But for battery operation, you've got quite a number of options. You've got things like these um, power banks. This is a 12 to 19 volt um, power bank. Your laptop battery, again, for if you're doing the occasional soldering job, you could make up an adapter to plug into that quite happily. Or power tool batteries, 18 volt power tool battery, um, would you know, run this for a fairly decent amount of time. The only sort of slight issue is it, it, this cuts off at about sort of just under 11 volts. So the smaller power tool, like the nominal 10.8 volt power tool batteries, it will be a little bit marginal. You might just about get away with it. But I don't think you get a, a huge amount of lifetime out of it. Um, so the nice thing, you've got a, uh, a wide input range, 12 to 24 volts, and the output power you get varies from 17 to 65 watts. So at 24 volts, it does actually heat up really quickly. So you've got about 65 watts available. When you first turn it on, it gets in standby mode, which is nice. So it's not suddenly getting hot so you just hit the button and you can see it's heat, it heats up in you know, literally a few seconds and you're you're basically ready to go so that that yeah you know, in terms of power it's good you know you can get a decent amount of power into uh, sort of fairly big loads you've got sort of push button temperature adjust on here uh, can't remember how you do this yeah so you've got temperature adjustment um, and you can turn it off you just hold the two buttons it switches off so again it, for for Maybe you have to exit from setting mode. So you press the both buttons, it switches off back to standby mode. Um, it's also got an accelerometer in it, so if you just leave it sat doing nothing, it will actually in it. Firstly, it goes down to a, a low temperature mode, then it'll then it'll switch off completely. Power is via a two. It's a 2.5 mil power jack. Slightly annoying that it's not a 2.1. That's a bit more common, but 2.5s are reasonably common. And it's also got these, this USB connector. The main reason for that is so you can plug into it and update firmware. If you plug this in, it enumerates as a drive. And as well as firmware, there's also a, com a text config file that you can set things like the um, the idle time delay, the default temperature, and a few other things. So you don't need in any any software. You just plug it in and edit the text file to edit some parameters. So that, that's quite a nice feature. And no, you can't actually run the thing off five volts. I mean, a five volt soldering iron. You can buy five volt soldering irons, but they're just no good. You cannot get enough power. You know, you need to be pulling. You know, sort of good five to ten amps to get a decent soldering iron at five volts which no usb port is going to do so if you see someone selling a usb soldering iron just laugh at them it's absolutely useless so I'm not, i think in terms of just flexibility and you've got very small size lightweight you know in terms of the additional stuff you have to carry it's basically just this and a, a lead and you make up a lead with whatever plugs suit the mains adapters you're, you happen to be taking with you or the batteries you're taking with you i think the concept i think is great there's a few things that i think they've fallen down on implementation i think the body is a bit too small it's there's no real ergonomics on the grip i think what they could maybe have done is if they'd have perhaps put some sort of silicone or neoprene rubber sort of thing so you could actually hold it down about there and also maybe have it thick so you could actually set it down and it would actually sit away from there as it is although you know the tip doesn't actually touch the touch the ground and you do have this auto power off thing you know that would get hot enough to damage like say a you know a nice hotel room table or something that you put it down on it's and the case feels a bit plasticky some sort of rubber grip would be nice but the, the overall build quality does actually seem seem quite quite good um, so in theory you've got this programmability. I, um, I believe there is actually some sort of SDK to write your own software. There's a, it's an STM32 so it wouldn't be hard to reverse engineer it, I don't think if you wanted to play around with it. So I think yeah this is definitely the right direction but I think there are a few ways this could be even better. Obviously because you've got this varying power depending on the supply voltage it's basically a fixed resistive, yeah, it's just switching a, a fixed resistive element on and off. What would be nice is if they actually had a full switch mode regulator in here, like a buck regulator or a boost regulator to a high heater voltage. That would allow a few more things. For example, it would allow you to set a maximum power level. Now, the reason that would be useful is if you're running off, let's say, a power bank, you might find that you've got a power bank that can't quite put out enough juice to run this at its, you know, the voltage it, it works at. Again, yeah, or maybe a, perhaps a mains adapter or a laptop adapter. So what would be really handy is to say, you know, please you know, never draw more than let's say two amps or one amp or one and a half amps or whatever um, just to give you that slight increase in flexibility on um, power supplies um, so it would be nice if it ran at low voltage 10.8 would be nice for three cells again if you had a boost regulator in there it would be nice if you could actually get it to run on two cells so you could actually almost have a maybe a slot on you can envisage maybe have a like a two cell battery pack that you can just slide on and still still be quite a nice package so you could have like a self-contained option or a remote battery 
you know, if, if that's what you want, I think that would be a, a, bit, a bit of an improvement. The other thing, which I think is a ri yeah, ridiculous emission, there's no work light, but yeah, all they have to do is stick a little three mil lead. I might even actually see if I can mod this to get a, a little three mil white lead on here, because again, yeah, you're quite often going to be working in situations where a, a little bit of light would be really helpful. And obviously this uses a non-standard element um, and tip. It's, you know, it's a combined tip element like the Metcals and JBCs, which although it means the tips effectively are more expensive, it also means that you know you should have much better coupling between the element and the um, the tip. There is a screw clamp. I don't like the fact they used an Allen screw on here. So if you need to change tips, you need to find find the Allen key. You do get an Allen key with it, but obviously you'll lose that because there's no way of it being. Um, captive on here so I mean you could easily just replace I'd, re I'd probably replace that with uh, just a Phillips screw so I could replace these tips more easily so you've also got the heating element and the, and the thermocouple temperature sensor this feels like it's sort of ceramic um, and so this long body means it is quite solid yeah, once it's in there even with even when it's not screwed down I think you probably need to screw it just to get the electrical connection but um, this looks like it's maybe stainless um, so it does, although it's a bit plasticky, it's, you know, it feels fairly solid. I think yeah, it doesn't really need, yeah, it's nice that it's small, but it doesn't really need to be quite this small. They could have definitely made it a little bit bigger. Yeah, I think if you're using this a lot, I think it might be a bit uncomfortable because there's no real sort of positive grip here. Certainly if it's a case where you're taking a soldering iron just in case, you know, as a, a, a you know, the sort of thing where you might need to use it, but um, I'm planning on it, you know, this is going to take up almost no extra space. So it's, it will be almost silly not to take it with you. Now, technically, we look inside. Yeah, the build quality of this is actually quite nice. Um, one thing I'm very impressed by with is that actually the power connector. There's so many really crappy power jacks available. This one's really nice. There's, um, it looks like it's actually got spring contacts. Might be a bit hard to see on it, but that, there's actually sort of spring contact all the way around the barrel and the centre pin. It's not got one of these horrible studs. It's actually a, a continuous pin that comes out and straight into the PCB. So that, that, that's that's. Quite nicely engineered, say 2.1 might be a little bit more flexible, but I mean, for something like this I think you'd probably want to make up your own lead to whatever your power adapter is anyway, so I think the fact it's a 2.5 isn't really a huge deal. It seems to have sort of fairly nicely made connectors onto the, um, the element, these sort of spring contacts here. For some reason I don't really understand why the processor's on a little plug-in PCB. So, so it's an STM32. So I'm sure that they could have actually got that onto onto a single PCB if they really wanted to. I don't really see the point in having that. There is actually in the lid, there is a little bit of foam that presses that down and stops it popping out, which is uh, quite nice. And down here we've just got, there's a, a MOSFET for controlling the power on off. And there's um, that's just the buck regulator that supplies the uh, display and the processor. So if you, if you had like a full power buck regulator on this, I think you would need, need to make it a little bit bigger to make the uh, get the inductor you know, you're talking about 60 watts, so that's a, a not insignificant inductor size. So I think it would have to get a bit chunky, but I think that would that would give you enough flexibility to, um, yeah, make it quite a lot more useful. One nice feature about using a pack like this is it's actually um, you can select the voltage from 12 up to 19 volts. So with this iron, you can select the trade-off between power and runtime, which is uh, quite handy. Obviously, it's got the usual 5 volt charging as well for charging other stuff. So uh, it's quite a nice solution. And another potential improvement, although I mean, two and a half, I've got no problem really with it running off a two and a half power jack. The problem is that most of the sort of power jack leads you get are this sort of, you know, sort of two core figure eight type lead, and they're not particularly flexible. So if you, you know, put it down, then this cable is going to drag this thing off the table. So it would be nice if they maybe supplied it with a nice sort of soft silicone lead, even if it just came with a bare end that you could then terminate with whatever you wanted at the other end. Because um, I don't think I've ever actually seen a nice sort of like soft silicone type lead with a power jack on it. Because that's something that'd be really nice. And obviously, yeah, silicone type stuff would be burn proof as well. So that that that's a, a minor improvement I'd like to see. But um, yeah, so de definitely a step in the right direction. Very useful. I'll certainly, you know, pretty much always take this with me. Yeah, for jobs where I'm not necessarily expecting to need to solder, might might have to in an emergency. Um, you know, a Mark II. You know, I'll probably get a few other tips for it. Um, the tips aren't hugely easy to get hold of at the moment, but there are one or two sources of them. Um, but uh, no, so I think it's a, probably the most generally useful portable iron that I've found so far, and um, hopefully maybe a, a Mark II version could be even better. Say so if um, it had 
Um, I'm not really sure whether it would be better to have, say, a, a, a boost regulator to a high heat of voltage or maybe a buck regulator to a low voltage. So at least if you did that, if it was like going down to maybe a nominally you know, 7 or 8 volt heater or something, it means that on a lower battery voltage, the regulator would just shut down and it would pass through. So you still get some functionality at lower battery voltage. Um, or um, so I think the problem with the boost regulator obviously is you get to a lower lower supply voltage, the current's going to start getting a bit stupid. But again, if you've got some way of uh, giving it an input power limit, then that, that gives you a lot of flexibility. And also, it might give you the option to run off, say, maybe some D cells or um, a few other um, battery options. But um, no, I think all in all, it's uh, a very good start. It's about the first sort of real you know, innovation in portable soldering iron for an awfully long time. And um, hopefully we'll see some um, some other things along that line come along.